And we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ReadZ Live, uh, ReadZ's ongoing series of webinars where I bring on professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write and publish better books. Uh, if you intentionally turned up for this one, you'll know it is the return of First Line Frenzy uh, with beloved editor uh, Rebecca Heyman. Uh, if this is your first one, don't worry. Uh, buckle up. It's going to be a fun one. Uh, if you're a returning uh, visitor, welcome back. Uh, while we're waiting for our guests to join, uh, why don't you tell me where you're from? Uh, I'll see who's in the comments here already. See Cliff, bonsoir from Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, we have Michael from Denver, Colorado. Colin from Columbia, South Carolina. Wonderful. Uh, we have Celia from Orosi, California. Glad to see you all joining us today. Uh, for those of you uh, who have not been to a First Line Frenzy before, uh, a week ago I sent out the Readsy newsletter asking people to send in the first lines, by which you mean the first sentence of their stories. Uh, it could be a short story, it could be a novel, it could be a memoir. Uh, and we're going to pick a whole handful today and show them to our editor, Rebecca Heyman, who's going to uh, react to it. She's never seen any of it before. I've selected uh, the ones we're going to use today. And uh, yeah, we'll get some feedback. She'll give you some tips. It's going to be uh, a fun, enlightening uh, experience. Uh, glad to see all the returning guests here. Bev from Bristol, Efren from LA in California, Marine from Birmingham here in England. Uh, ooh, Crystal from Worcester, Ohio. Great town name. Uh, well, glad you could all join us. Uh, I know a lot of folks have sent in their first lines. Thank you very much. I uh, really love to see the enthusiasm, and I've pretty much read through all of them. Great selection of ones. Uh, but I picked just a handful uh, today for Becca to react to. The important thing to know is I did not uh, go and pick my favorites or what I think is the best. I try to find a range of first lines from a, a, a sort of assortment of genres. Uh, so we'll be able to get all different types of feedback. Even if yours is not selected today, there'll be plenty that we'll be learning uh, from Becca's uh, feedback. Salim Anwar from Chennai in India. Shana from South Africa. Fantastic. Curtis from Bayshore, Long Island. Good to see you. And the city's represented. Kathy from Laguna, New Mexico. Uh, we're just going to be a minute or two, make ourselves comfortable. Uh, this is going to last about an hour. If yours is not chosen, uh, don't worry. There's always uh, a chance to appear in a future one. We run these a few times uh, every year. Uh, they're always good fun. I enjoy doing them. Uh, and I really love uh, seeing folks, uh, seeing what everyone's up to, what everyone's writing. Uh, we have Alan here from Scotland. Uh, we've got Deb from Brentwood, Tennessee. Stacy from Spring Branch, uh, Texas. Wonderful. Great to see everyone uh, just popping in now. Uh, yeah, I think folks are going to be joining us in drips and drabs over the next few minutes, but uh, we have a lot to get on with. Uh, so I reckon, without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce my guest, who is uh, a developmental editor, one of the original ones here at Readsy. You know her best as the creator of First Line Frenzy. Uh, the queen of mean and nice sometimes, but always very useful, uh, Rebecca Heyman. Becca, how are you doing? I'm great. Queen of mean and nice. That's like a small asterisk, like a critical asterisk in the corner. You know, Man, like, that's, and... that, It's like a very Donald Trump thing where like he'll say something and realize he should just negate it just by saying something else. <sighs> you mean and also very nice. <laughs> <laughs> They're all great people. They're all great people. Um, how's yeah. everybody? Happy New Year, everyone. It's the first time I'm seeing everybody in 2024. Yeah. So, well, how is 2024 treating you so far? Have you, uh, what sort of work you've been doing? Been reading anything good? I have been reading so much. I actually just, I took myself to the bookstore yesterday and got two new books. Well, this is new to paperback, I think. Notes on Your Sudden Disappearance, which I'm really excited to read. Um, the first few pages are in like a, a second person address, which I find very enticing uh, and just really interesting and hits a lot of uh, checks for me. Um, and then I got, have you, are, is this making a splash in the UK as well, Northwoods? I am, I've not been made aware of it, but I haven't been to the shops for a while. Daniel Mason is a Pulitzer finalist and this came out last year. Um, it's about all the different people who have lived in this secluded cabin in the new england woods and of course i live in new england um and it starts with these i guess this couple that is that sort of run away from a puritan settlement and then it just goes through time 
And it's all of these people are sort of connected by their stay at this cabin in the woods. And it just seems kind of cool. I think this is the kind of book that I see and read and I go, I'm going to give this to my dad and my father-in-law for the holidays. Like I'm always making that list in my head of giftable books. And I think oh, yeah. this is probably going to be at the top, but I'll keep you posted. Is it sort of of that, you know, yearning for a simpler life type of book? And not just that, but like, I'm always, for me, a giftable book is not too heavy on like not heavy on the spice you don't want to be like here father-in-law there's only like 12 explicit sex scenes in this you know that <laughs> so i <laughs> you want it's like i've given uh, books that i gift often are migrations by charlotte mcconaughey and um hamnet by maggie o'farrell and of course lessons in chemistry was very giftable you know like or um remarkably bright creatures that was that's so giftable right the one with the octopus and it it's just you look for these things that are very human stories. Anxious people is one that I gifted a lot the year it came out. So I, I look for stories that have like a certain amount of feel good energy, but also very riveting and uh, and really beautiful prose. Those yeah. are my standards. Well, uh, as uh, as we approach a uh, holiday season later in the year, we'll maybe have to uh, get you to put together a gift yeah. list. Yes, that's a good idea. We should do that. Though I'm like, I just constantly all year, I keep a list in my phone and I'm like, give this to your dad. And I. Yeah. And then just like oh, too many, like there's only so many books. Uh, cool. Uh, well... No one expects me to show up with something other than books as gifts. And I think yeah. I'm like pressure off. I also wrap them very beautifully. Like this way to wrap books where you can tuck the card like inside in, and it's all little like folded V's. Oh it's i'll have to gift you a book one of these days martin and then well when, when we finally meet in person uh, I'll, I'll be expecting nothing less uh well i realized we have a lot of people sending in their entries i mentioned we had close to i think close to two thousand people send in uh, a submission uh, before we get started uh, rebecca could you give us the spark notes of uh, what first line frenzy is all about i would love to first line frenzy is first and foremost, supposed to be fun and educational. Um, do not post your first line in the comments. We will not be looking at, at lines that are posted in the comments. Our, our goal with First Line Frenzy is to figure out with just one sentence where we can strengthen writing and storytelling, even just from one sentence. And this, First Line Frenzy sort of began on uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter uh, many, many moons ago when I kind of said, I think I can tell everything I need to know about a book from its first line and I can prove it. And so I started posting first lines and getting first lines from authors uh, and just saying, okay, well, from this, what can I extrapolate and what can we learn and how can we improve? So um, that's kind of how First Line Frenzy was born and it has uh, morphed into this wonderful online community of writers and readers and aspiring critics. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's that's pretty much what we're up to today. I've not seen, as Martin said, I've not seen any of the lines that we're going to look at today. And I, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I wouldn't tell you what genre they come from unless it's like memoir. Or, or okay. Maybe, I love maybe know it's memoir, uh, but otherwise I do like to guess, as you all know, I do like to guess. So we'll see. All right. Well, let us uh, start with this one right here. Rough in all the wrong places, the stranger wanders in and sits at the bar of some unnamed roadside inn. Uh, well, I'm quite puzzled by this opening phrase, rough in all the wrong places, the stranger. So we know because of grammar that rough in all the wrong places has to refer as a modifying phrase, has to refer to its nearest noun. So this is a stranger who's rough in all the wrong places. And like, are we talking like maybe like calluses? Like just, do we need a pedicure or are we rough around the edges? And if we are rough around the edges, then who is the narrator that they know that how are they close enough to know that while still calling this character the stranger instead of using a more personal name? So I, I think there's a little bit of dissonance there in, in terms of what exactly we're talking about or what exactly we're commenting on. I don't love the echo on in as a preposition and in as a roadside in. I, I feel like that creates a lot of sort of insulation in the sentence. We have rough in, wanders in, roadside in, and it just makes everything feel very close when generally we want language to 
broaden and open and reach. So I find this quite vague. The stranger, the unnamed roadside in um, all the wrong places. These are all very, all of this language is very vague and just gestures kind of ambiguously. And so I like to see more specificity in a first line. I want to be more compelled by this specific person walking into this specific place for a specific reason. And I'm not getting that here. Uh, cool. Thank you, John, for sending that one in uh, from their fantasy book, uh, The Promise. Uh, just wait, I'm going to load up our next one just here. As I mentioned, they all come from uh, different genres. Uh, here's our next one from Morag. You're a little echoey, Martin. Am I? Okay. Yeah. Is it just me? Can people mention in the comments if he sounds echoey? Uh, yeah, let me know that. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I can sort of try to fix that between the next bit. It's better. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, the man who says he is my husband has brought me to this place. Uh, if the theme of the day is ambiguous, I'm not going to be very happy. This, um, so the ambiguity here is probably gesturing at an amnesia trope, right? The man who says he's my husband lets me know that the protagonist who could be of either gender, of any gender, um, doesn't know exactly who that person is. And so I, I want to say this is amnesia trope. I want to say this maybe is either romance or general fiction, genre-wise. What is it? Uh, it is a mystery. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, again, this place, too vague, too vague. I really like the idea, the man who says he is my husband, but the rest of the sentence needs to be brought into um, more clarity. I would love to see a little bit more uh, specificity there to, to make us care more about where this person is. Cool. Uh, that is uh, Morag Dennett, if I don't laugh, mystery, thriller, suspense. Uh, okay, moving right along to the next one here uh, from P. Lima Orenstein. Hmm. The beautiful long robes of Aurora Fulbright were more than just clothing. They were sheepskin to hide the wolf within. So I, I sense a lot of syntax problems here. Um, <sighs> Syntax is the order in which words appear in your sentence. And so the first issue I have is the beautiful long robes of Aurora Fulbright. Aurora Fulbright's beautiful long robes, right? So why do we use a prepositional phrase when we could, in fact, be more efficient by using a possessive apostrophe? Um, I love this idea of clothing being sheepskin to hide the wolf. but I think within is actually a mistake here in syntax as well. Um, the colon sets up a sort of a result or um, it, it tells us that this is going to be the product of the sentence before. So Aurora Fulbright's beautiful long robes were more than just clothing or were more than mere clothing. They were sheepskin to hide the wolf. We know the wolf is in the sheepskin. That's already implied. So that little like dangling within, I feel, is a roof robe was beautiful and robes more than just clothing. They were sheepskin to hide the wolf. I kind of like that. I, I'm very, I mean, it's very intriguing. I, I love that idea. I love the idea of clothing as a weapon or as a mask. I, you know, I, I think that just suggests something very interesting about this book um, as a whole. What do you think it is? Um, Aurora Fulbright feels like a fantasy name to me. Uh, I think it's probably fantasy romance. It's under romance. The Heir and the Hopeful. Ooh. That's, that's the sort of name that reads better than it sounds. Because it's got the two H's. Oh, yeah. It sounds like romanticy to me. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, P. Lima Orenstein, for sending that one in. Uh, our yeah. next one comes from J.M. Lark. No one has ever been so angry while eating a blueberry muffin. Uh, I love this line. <laughs> I think it's very um, quippy and direct and specific, right? It's not just, uh, I'm so angry, right? It's like, no one's ever been so angry while eating a blueberry muffin. I think it's kind of charming and voicey. I would, I would let this, I would let this be just as it is. 
Nice. Well done, J.M. Locke. Uh, Young Adult Summerland. Uh, thanks for sending that one in, J.M. Uh, straight on with our next one from uh, Ron. Whoops. Ron. Too big. Okay. Yeah. There it is. Ethan Harley Hibbard, husband, father, and chronic provocateur, sprawled on a bus stop bench in a loosely tied hospital gown and slippers, one arm around a potted plant, and balancing a bedpan on his lap. <laughs> okay, so first of all, uh, through the magic of television, Martin, please change these hellacious hyphens to M dashes, long dashes. Thank you. Um, we have a small issue. I first want to say I, I like the sentence. I love its sprawl. I love the way it just gets weirder. And the specificity is all over the place from the name to uh, the sort of noun modifiers for that person to the verb choice sprawled on the bus stop bench. Uh, the only issue for me is that so sprawled is our first verb, right? And we have to keep that same verb tense, which is just simple past or historical um, historical past when we get to the next verb, uh, which is balancing. So he sprawled and balanced. He didn't sprawled and balancing. So if you take out everything in the middle, this is a great way to check the parallelism of your verbs. Take out everything between them and make sure that they match. So just changed uh, balancing to balanced. Uh, and I think this is, let's see, sprawled on a bus stop bench in a loosely tied hospital, loosely tied hospital gown and slippers, one arm around a potted plant and balanced by pen. I, I quite like this. It's very, um, yeah, I would definitely keep reading. I think this is really magnetic. Whoops, I muted myself. Thank you, Ron, for sending that one in uh, from a title that is The Cost of His Living. Uh, great. Uh, oh, <laughs> Some very good titles. That YA title, whatever that Summerland, that's how yeah. I love that title too. So way to crush the titles, folks. Strangely enough, like a, I managed to pick a bunch where they're describing like a like a father, and this is a no exception here. Uh, this one comes from Karen Kennedy Johnson. Pa was gone, but the remains of his breakfast, brown liquor and cornbread, sat on the kitchen table. Uh, again, hyphens for M dashes, please. Um, folks, M dashes are the long dash. They're created by making um, two hyphens without a space between and without a space on either side. And then when you press space bar or enter, it will magically turn into a long dash if you are using Microsoft Word uh, and really most other platforms as well. So I like this. I like that we don't know if Pa is gone, like just out of the house or gone like dead. And I'm I'm intrigued by that ambiguity. I think that that feels very intentional. So like sometimes ambiguity is bad when we say words like thing or stuff, right? Like those are bad ambiguities because they can point to so many different um, different options. But this ambiguity is very pointed and intentional and I am intrigued. Good job. Uh, we have a question here from Julie Davis asks, why use the long dashes? What is what is the function of the M dash? Yeah, so the M dash is like a lovely little mark of punctuation because it's quite elastic. So um, the M dash creates a longer pause than a comma, but a shorter pause than an end stop, like a semicolon or a period. Um, it is very helpful to offset parenthetical phrases without using parentheses. So for example, can you, Martin, can you throw on the... Um, the one I liked about the bus stop bench. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep, give me one second. Uh, I'm going to put the M dashes back. <laughs> <laughs> or even, you know, honestly, even the one that we just saw, right? So, like, we don't need to know the contents of breakfast, but it adds a level of detail that's quite nice. It it can it can indicate a certain regionality. Um, and certainly the idea that the breakfast was brown liquor and cornbread, that's kind of an important character detail for, for Pa. And so it, that is a, a parenthetical phrase in the sense that if we pull that phrase out, it does not change the core meaning of the sentence. Same here, Ethan Harley Hibbard, we don't need to know husband, father, and chronic provocateur in order to understand the, the meaning of the sentence. So that's a parenthetical phrase, but we don't want to enclose all of these things in parentheses because that's almost too strong of an aside, right? That's almost um, sort of 
creating what's in the parentheses, whereas an F dash keeps that um, non-essential modifier in play in the primary sentence, uh, but does set it off as something non-essential. So they're very, they're a very sort of like poetic way to extend your lines. They can also create uh, nice moments of pause, right? If you end a line of dialogue in an M dash, that indicates being cut off right, very abrupt end to dialogue. So the M dash is quite handy. Uh, it just has to be used correctly. And a hyphen is only used to join, in, in non-scientific prose, a hyphen is really only joined, um, used to join um, adjectives, or, you know, if you have, or if you're writing out numbers, you know, and you, to connect the tens to the ones place, you use a hyphen. So hyphens are quite utilitarian, but M dashes can be quite lyrical and poetic. Cool. Thank you coming to my TED talk on M dashes. <laughs> uh, here's our next one. Uh, this one comes from uh, ooh, an author named Silk. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. As she hurried to her car, Diana Day's high heeled boots wrapped like an irate judge's gavel on the sidewalk. <sighs> so like, I, I like this little slice of descriptive language. Um, it gives this woman's steps a certain, I don't want to say haughtiness, but like equating her steps to a judge's gavel gives her a certain amount of authority, makes us think her steps are quite confident and that she's a very sort of in charge person. And I love that. Do we think this is a great first line? Not necessarily. Uh, hurrying to the car is a snooze fest. And so I, I have great confidence in this author's ability to write beautifully and to to coin some really beautiful phrases and interesting phrases, but I, I'm I'm unconvinced that this is the right moment to start this story. Cool. This is uh, Silk's Degrees of Honesty. So maybe maybe it is sort of like a, a legal thing. It's a general fiction, but it could be a bit of a a, a legal uh, could be a legal fiction. And another uh, great. Like really crushing the titles today, everyone. Good job. Um, this next one, I'll tell you ahead of time that it is a children's book. Okay. Trapped in our bedroom, I crack the door just enough to spy the beast. Uh, this one gives me, it gives me the oof, right? Because I worry that the beast is like actually an, an adult who is behaving badly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't... You do not need to capitalize the in the beast, um, even though it is the only beast around. Uh, you can just capitalize the B in beast. That's fine. I I like this. It makes me sad, but I I think it's the great start for like a middle grade a middle grade book. Like it it definitely feels um, voicey and and consistent to a child's voice and relatable to children readers you know child readers so i think this is really good and sad but and and like a little troubling but a, a well-constructed line if i told you the name of the book would it change what you believe it's called once upon a pug oh thank god oh my god it's a dog it's a pug <laughs> i thought it was like someone's drunkle like <laughs> Do I just go to that dark place too quickly? I'm maybe I do. Um, wow, what a relief. Okay, next time I'm you see me sliding down the rabbit hole, if you could maybe flag it earlier, that would be really nice. I said it was a children's book already. <laughs> I was I, a point. <laughs> Children deal with dark stuff all the time, and but this is a pug. It's a pug. It's a pug. It's probably a pug. Okay, um, yeah. I still like it, but no, I'm, I'm mad at myself for immediately thinking the worst of me. Uh, Mandy Fletcher, thank you so much. Our next one is from Christine Hamilton. A tropical breeze can be a strange postman. Huh, what a lovely little puzzle. I, I like that. Now, normally I think many of you have heard me say like, please do not start by talking about the weather, but this isn't really talking about weather. This is, this is something else entirely. Uh, I, the only thing I'm going to say is why be wishy-washy about it can be a strange postman. Why not like, um, why not own it? The tropical breeze, tropical breezes make for strange postmen or yeah, maybe that. 
or a trop uh, the tropical breeze is a strange postman or I don't know, there's I love this association you're making, but I don't like the can be it just feels too soft. And I would love for you to be a little bit more assertive in line one. So for folks who are new to this, uh, what is the breeze? What? What do you mean? Uh, what, 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 what about, you know, on, on almost literal level, like what, what is, uh, you know, the tropical breeze is a strange postman. Like, uh, what do you think is the sort of in, intent of this uh, line? Uh, I think that it's probably the winds have changed. So the, like the, mm. the wind carrying a message of some kind or like the wind brings some, is this, is there something I'm missing that you no, know that's that what, I know? what I was sort of getting at. Oh, okay. I think maybe not everyone makes the, the, the association perhaps. Oh, okay. Well, this is actually an important thing, right? Anytime that you see a film or a TV show when the wind kicks up and particularly at the beginning of a movie, uh, that is the wind of change. And it is telling you that something's a coming. And so the wind is always sort of a beacon of change, just like water is like a birth element and fire is purification. We think of the wind, we look at the wind and we think of change. Cool. Uh, Christine, thank you very much. Uh, that's from a piece of science fiction tentatively titled Mission Centauri. Uh, uh, this next one comes from uh, Debbie Bocanfuso. Bocanfuso. Uh, here we go. In a single sentence, only six words, Ben's email had stopped faith in her tracks. <sighs> just tell us the six words. Just, just make the sentence your first line. Don't dangle the carrot. No one likes that. Um, or don't let on that it's an email and say something like, um, you know, six words, it, 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 it took only six words to blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty for faith. But stopping in your tracks is a cliche, first of all, so we don't want to do that. And you're just telling us that you're, you're making a promise that something interesting is coming, but you're not just coming out and telling us what it is. And that's silly. Just tell us what it is. Uh, cool. Debbie, thank you for that one. That's a piece of literary fiction, a Seaside Tea Shop. Uh, so, sounds like almost like a, a fun sort of a sort of holiday romance, but uh, yeah, very cool. Uh, this next one is a memoir from Samantha Playdens. This daiquiri is broken. Okay, I this is a fact cake, right? Like I, I think this is a fact cake. Uh, if you are new to First Line Frenzy, then fact cake is part of our. Uh, community parlance for um, a sentence that is all fact, no feeling. Uh, this is an observation that doesn't totally make sense to me. And maybe that's the point. If, if this paragraph is going to go on to say that it's doubling, like if, if there's some indication this person has had one daiquiri too many, perhaps, and that's why it seems broken, like maybe that's what it is. Uh, but there's just not enough meat on the bone. It's it's not enough. We need more. And I yeah. love a short sentence. Everybody who's watched more than one of these knows that I usually respond very positively to a, a rather direct uh, first line. But this one is just a little too pared down. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, what they're going for, this daiquiri isn't working. The booze isn't kicking in or it's too weak or something. But I guess it's yeah. it just makes you pause for a bit too long for it to, to land. Yeah. Um, yeah, or like, I, I just think if that is the case, there's, there are far more interesting ways to bring us into that moment of disappointment than this. Cool. Thank you, Samantha. That's from uh, the uh, memoir, The Sam I Am. Good title. That is a great title. God, <laughs> it's so uh, good. I love that as a memoir title. Um, yeah. Here's the one. This one is from Philip Leiter. Let me put this in the right place. Thank you. I thought I was gonna need my readers. I was with my sister and my mom and I was making fun of them for needing reading glasses. I already have terrible vision, like truly awful vision. And I was like, there's no way I need reading glasses. I already wear the strongest prescription in all of prescription town. And then my sister was like, really, we'll put these on. And I put them on and I was like, oh my God, you guys don't have to squint all the time. <laughs> How? And I thought I would need them today, but as long as you keep putting these uh down there i should be all right okay 
that's my story. Through the metal bars of the small wooden shed built only 40 hours previously for his own captivity, Stephen Hopkins watched as his fellow shipmates readied the gallows that would hang him until dead for the crime of mutiny. Okay. Okay. The syntax is syntaxing hard. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very dense. How are there metal bars on the wooden shed? If they built it only 40 hours previously for his own captivity, they just like had metal bars on the ship that were ready and waiting to become a cage. I don't know. That seems weird. Uh, so I don't totally understand why we would name two materials right through the metal bars of the small wooden shed. Why? Uh, built only 40 hours previously for his own captivity. Uh, again, why is that sort of germane to our understanding of what's going on? It, it's not. It's not. Uh, Stephen Hopkins watched as his fellow shipmates readied the gallows that would hang him until dead for the crime of mutiny. I think maybe that's the first line. It doesn't really matter how he's contained. I don't know that they do a lot of shed building on ships, unless they've docked somewhere. But even then, they would put them in the brig. There's already places to contain someone on a ship. So if they've if they've docked somewhere, they would have left him on the ship in some kind of captivity, right? And um, and if they're still on board, I don't buy that they've built a whole metal and wood shed when they could just tie him up, right? There's some this sort of reads to me almost as, because it's historical fiction, I'll tell you now, as maybe a, a piece of detail that came up in the research that felt too good to not, you know, slip into the uh, to the prose. Like if they found, I, oh yeah, people did build like prisons, makeshift brigs. Well, but like, there's always like the belly, there's always the, the like bottom of a ship where you can tie someone up. It just seems like there's a lot more practical ways to hold someone captive on a ship. And again, stepping out of my lane here as I am, neither ship captain nor crew. But I'm going to guess uh, that if someone is destined for hanging, also, hanging seems like a real inefficient way to kill someone when you have the whole ocean at your disposal. Am I wrong? No, I, I, I don't know the uh, the practices of this particular Navy or, or merchant Navy. It feels like mutiny is a walk the plank sitch. But again, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, look, we have a lot of historical questions. And so maybe it's the opposite of too much research. Maybe it's too little research. The th mm, maybe. Well, that was a uh, the Tempest. Oh, well, uh, someone else used that title, guys. <laughs> the Tempest, <laughs> part two. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Phil, for sending that one in. <laughs> like, turns out, uh, Prospero is still alive. Uh, he's ready for more tricks. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that probably starts well because like, the the bit that is interesting, as you say, is like him watching his his pals basically prepare the gallows to kill him. Rather yeah. than his pals have also built the shed, you know, that sort of is would be a bit more immediate. Yeah, I mean, it's just there's too much and yet not enough. Thank you, Philip. Our next one comes from Sally O'Grady. Walking along the dimly lit corridor that bridges the two wards, the echo of my laceless shoes plodding along betrays how unhinged I have become. Is plodding a real unhinged way to perambulate? I feel like there are many sort of unhinged ways to motor and plotting is not one of them. Uh, there's so much language here devoted to footsteps. I think it's, I think it's too many, too much, perhaps. Um, bridges the two wards. So we're in some kind of hospital setting, maybe a mental hospital setting. The echo of my laceless shoes, right? So laceless. So we, we're, we're definitely talking about a psych ward of some kind, because uh, I think that's a point of detail to let us know that this person is not allowed to have shoelaces. Um, but if they're a patient of this place or an inmate of this place, depending on where we are, uh, they might have just been given slippers instead of the, laceless shoes. I don't know. I'm, I'm having trouble imagining the echo of plodding. Like I've got yeah. the sort of things I can imagine, like the echo of a squ squeaking slippers or squeaking shoes or, or the hard right. tap or something. And like also, what kind of laceless shoe? We're thinking like rubber bottoms. I just it doesn't seem like uh, 
the math ain't mathin'. You know, it just doesn't seem like this adds up to reality. And I don't know, get where you're going and show us what happens instead of just plodding along, plodding along. You know, you want to tell me you've become unhinged? Show, don't tell, baby. Don't threaten me with a good time. You know, show <laughs> me coming apart at the seams. Don't tell me about it. The, uh, right? the comments are suggesting shuffling as a, another verb. Yeah, shuffling seems like it, it certainly wouldn't echo, but it definitely feels more consistent with this setting. Um, but either way, like I, I think this is just the wrong moment to begin because this is a boring moment and you could show us something majestically unhinged instead. Um, Marsha asks, okay to start a sentence with a, a gerund? I, uh, unlike the rest of the uh, like rest of European speaking world, um, I don't know uh, grammar words. What is a gerund? So it's actually a gerund, gerund, and a gerund is a noun operating as a verb. And yes, it is fine. Um, usually these are ing words. Um, and yeah, like anything can work if it works, but it's, we don't, I don't like to make these sweeping statements about specific word types. For example, like ending a sentence in a preposition is sometimes just fine, but sometimes it's not, right? You saw that sentence that ended with within and i recommended pulling that out because it was not necessary um but like i i don't have a problem with it because of its part of speech i just had a problem with it because of its impact on the greater sentence so gerunds can be fine and they can be not fine okay we've got this next one here uh from oh just wait i haven't, I haven't actually changed it it's from benjamin uh bennett and it is appearing on screen now who do I have a Bennett sister on there? No, I have Jane Austen. Um, the thief whispered a prayer to Mother Moon as she ran. So there's a little bit of a syntax problem. Syntax is emerging as a motif today. Um, um, pronouns refer to their nearest named noun. And so here we have uh, as she ran at the end of this sentence, and that actually refers to Mother Moon and not the thief who was all the way over at the front of the sentence. So we have to leapfrog over a noun to get to the correct uh, reference noun, and that is a problem. So I'm interested in the prayer. I would like to know what it is. I don't often recommend opening with dialogue, but you could incorporate the dialogue and a dialogue tag about, you know, the thief and how they are running um, into the dialogue. And, and so I think I would be more compelled by this if I heard the prayer. So like mother moon, comma, prayer bits, comma, end quotation, the thief whispered as she ran through the woods or wherever the hell she's running. Cool. That is uh, what John, do you reckon this is? Um, I don't know. Is it fantasy? You're starting to doubt yourself. Yeah, it's fantasy. Um, from a book called Rebels and Royals. We're getting a... Uh, a lot of these, like, probably. X and Y. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thank Remember you. Remember when I was in a court? A court of X and Y. And yeah. everything, was court. everything was a court. Thank you, Sarah Jane. <laughs> For that special torture. Uh, our next one here comes from Nick Butcher. Oh, very similar. And well, that of. night, <laughs> hey, you chose these. That night, he followed her as far as the abandoned olive grove, where the ancient trees stood ragged and forgotten against the sky. Okay, but I really like this one. It's quite lovely. This is very lyrical. Um, I love these ragged forgotten trees that is quite stunning and there's something there's lovely tension in the idea that someone is being followed and that it's happened more than once i feel like because it says that night he followed her as far as the abandoned olive grove which maybe suggests on other nights he's followed her less or more um i find this perfect i would not change a thing well, well done. Uh, Nick Butcher, Mystery Thriller Suspense, another great title, Grave Doubts. Wait, Grave Doubts, okay. Like we love it, we love a grave pun, we love a pun, but I can almost guarantee you that there's that there are already 10 books with this title. <laughs> and, and that you will be absolutely buried underneath them in an <laughs> in Amazon search. So you need a different title. But Becca, what if there isn't? What if just stumbled upon? Guys at home, uh, check if there's already a Grave Dads. 
Go. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Has somebody already looked it up? I keep the comments closed while I'm talking, but someone go look. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I see in the um, the comments that someone says they're currently hate reading Throne of Glass. I th The Throne of Glass series by Sarah J. Mass has one of my favorite characters of all time, Manon Blackbeak of the Iron Teeth Witches. And I will also confess to you all that this is, if you can see my sweatshirt, this is a an Akotar sweatshirt. And all of these little charms are Akotar charms. The cauldron is on here somewhere. And if none of this means anything to you, you just haven't read the books yet. But I got it on Etsy. Is, that, is this official merge? Um, it is. I think it is actually. I think. Um, I think she got the the green light from from Sarah Janet. Oh, nice. Uh, cool. From like an independent maker, so I don't know. Ah. Nick, thank you for sending this one in. This next one uh, is uh, nonfiction. Uh, and by the way, I was right. Mandy says there are a ton of grave doubts. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is nonfiction. Did you say? Yes. Ugh, a rare unicorn in the FLF universe. This book isn't quite a Dear John letter to the Democratic Party, but it is a notice that it's time to have a serious conversation. Uh, I like that. I do. I think so many Americans feel, feel this way. Um, I, But I, I think the specificity of a Dear John letter needs to be echoed in the second half of your sentence here. So I would say... Something like, this book isn't quite a Dear John letter to the Democrat Democratic Party, but it is. Um, and then I would want you to name another type of letter or notice that's codified. Like, um, obviously not an eviction notice, but that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about. You know, something that balances the scales of a Dear John letter. And I don't know what that thing is yet. I would have to really sit here and think about it for a minute. But that is what I would rather see here. Yeah, it's sort of like when you have like your first written notice at work or something. Or... Yeah, or like even if it's um, but it is, but it is a notice that it's time to maybe define the relationship or like, you, you know, something like I don't know something that is in that relationship space. Maybe I don't know. I don't. Know. Well, I guess that serious conversation is that sort of yeah. What is the one thing before you break up? I guess is to have a serious chat about your relationship. Well, like the problem is a Dear John is, it's unexpected. That's why it's a Dear John letter, right? Mm. So I, I just, I want there to be more sort of thematic balance here. And that will be hard work, but I think it will pay off. So people in the comments are explaining that back in the day, it was a breakup letter. I guess these days you just uh, ghost them. <laughs> you say, just don't come to, just ghost them. Just don't, just don't talk to them at all. It's, it's ghosting, but you write it down. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I quite like that one. Thank you so much, uh, Mark Susson, a man without a party. Uh, here is I mean, a great title, a really good title. All good titles. Um, this next one is another children's book. Valora was an artist for 23 hours and 55 minutes of every day. Okay. I, I don't really get it. Like, because an artist, because being an artist is an identity marker, like, it, I don't know. I guess I'm interested in finding out more, but I'm not sure. This is one of those that just doesn't work right in isolation. I'm not, I, I think the jury's out on this. I, I can't know until I know what line two is. It doesn't like inherently bug me or anything, but I... I'm curious about what happens for the last five minutes of every day that sort of foundationally alters this, who this person is. And so maybe it's a good line because I'm interested in finding that out. It feels like it's specifically designed to, like what, what happens in that five minutes? And But almost, because then in my head I go like, okay, for 23 hours, so what happens in that time? But then again, does that also count for the time she probably spends sleeping? I don't know. Like, yeah, so it's more of an identity thing. That, yeah, it's... An identity thing, right? But then, like, if it's an identity... Uh, yeah, I don't know. So it brings up maybe, like, maybe more existential questions than we're looking for in the first sentence of a children's book. But it, is it YA or children's, does it say? It's called Valora's Eagle. Um, so it probably has maybe some sort of fantasy edge to it. I'm not sure. Just uh, my my categories are very broad. It's just children's. Yeah. Well, Valora is some some classic fantasy name 
content right there. Mm. I mean, that's very, we know that that's fantasy right away. So I, I don't know. I think I'm curious, but I would not be attached to this as a first line. I would, I would have to read more to, to know for sure. Cool. Uh, thank you very much for sending that one in. Christy, this one is Memoir from Tom Gale. Nidri in the 1960s, where being poor was a given, being abused was common, and being weird meant you probably wouldn't survive. This isn't a full sentence. Um, Nidri is a place? It's a, it's a low-income part of Edinburgh, I believe. Okay. So if this is the start of, if we're setting a scene, it would have to be um, Nidri in the 1960s, colon, eliminating both of those first two commas, where being poor was a given, being abused was common, and being weird meant you probably wouldn't survive. In If we do that, I, that is a good, that is a lovely sentence. And I'm interested in learning more about this place. Um, I think it was really just the punctuation throwing me off a little bit because we expected to find um, some kind of verb, right? Something happening. Uh, but instead, this is descriptive and that can be fine. We just need to make sure that readers understand what they're getting. Uh, I recently spoke to someone who said, my sister or my friend is writing a book and she says she doesn't believe in punctuation. To which I said, I look forward to her book never getting published because punctuation is really not about your belief system. It's about helping readers access your language in a sort of universally standardized way. And it is a flawed system. Punctuation is a flawed system, but it is not a useless system and therefore can't be ignored. And you can see that because we've changed no language here, but by changing the punctuation, we have accentuate, accentuated the meaning um, that this author was trying to capture in a really subtle way. Cool. Thank you for send, uh, sending that in. Tom Gale from uh, the memoirs. Oh, this is good. Tom Logs. Wait, what is it? His name is Tom Gale and the, the book is called Tomologues. I love it. I love Tomologues. I love it. That's great. Very uh, clever. Very good. Thanks, Tom, for sending that one in. Uh, this one uh, is nonfiction from Donna Indal. They were the Bonnie and Clyde of siblings. Okay. I, were there no, like, Crime duos, sibling crime duos, historically? I'm sure we could find one. But like Bonnie um, and Clyde, but the Bonnie and Clyde of this usually says to me, like, they were th thick as thieves, but not associated with, because Bonnie and Clyde were the Bonnie and Clyde of crime, therefore yeah. Bonnie and Clyde of something else, just makes me think, it's like, is there some sort of, like, romance slash sexual element to these siblings? And that's a bit off. That is more than a bit off. That is very off. I didn't even get there, and I thought the Beast was the drunkle. Yeah. So you <laughs> They are two of a kind. <laughs> um, These are okay. not, I guess, standard uh, uh, impressions that most people might have, but I, I found it. Yeah. Do we odd. read many books, Martin? Are we? Have we reached? Have we, have we turned the corner on like being sort of literate, literate, and competent, and now we're just being <laughs> uh, very yeah. Dark. We're, we're our, our media literacy uh, is just uh, at an all-time low now. I just <laughs> I see controversy everywhere. I can find it wherever wherever I need it. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't love this. I think saying that anyone is the Bonnie and Clyde of something, I think what Martin is saying is that, that they're sort of renegades and they're probably romantically uh, involved and they're sort of, uh, sort of doing something transgressive, but not incest. That's not the kind of crimes we're talking about here. So I don't think this sentence is working the way you want it to, unless you want everyone to think about incest. Um, that was nonfiction, Don Indal, great title as well. Let me tell you about the time I met Leonard Bernstein. <sighs> I mean, that's not a great title for me. I think, it, all right, it's just, for me, it sets up, oh, this is gonna be a real chatty, a chatty old book, maybe by you know an elder family member, yeah, but like when I, when people, when a person would, if someone said that phrase to me, like in person, <laughs> I would be like, okay. Yeah. Like it, just, it just seems like I'm going to be, it feels like one of those conversations I'm not going to be able to escape from no matter how hard I try. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it's a uh, yeah. It gets cracked out during appetizers uh, at a dinner out, and you realize that it's probably not going to end before like coffee comes. Like, this is going to be the longest dinner of my life. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Donna, for sending that one in. Uh, this next one comes from T. R. Gabriel. Mm. The sky looked as though every last piece of fireworks on Earth had been sent to space, then detonated all at once into a kaleidoscope of colors, some of which were observed for the first time ever by human eyes. What? Um, Piece of fireworks is a strange way to talk about fireworks. And your comma, so sent to space comma, implies uh, a like <clears throat> readers are always going to assume that what you write is happening in chronicolo- chronological order, chronological, chronological order, unless they are told otherwise. So you could eliminate the then, then just acts as, um, it, it functions as a preposition in a lot of ways and it is often unnecessary. So the comma does that work already. On earth had been sent to space comma, detonated all at once into a kaleidoscope of colors, but then you have this terrible phrase at the end. Um, This is, this is not great. This is not great. We're just looking at the sky. It's, it's weird colors. We could have gotten there a lot sooner and with greater efficiency. It's just too much and yet again, not enough. So is this science fiction? It is, yes. Yeah, well, Kel Surprise. My science fiction friends, we we tend to be a little verbose when we are world building and we need to cut that out. So you can just tell us what color the sky was. Because I don't I don't believe that the sky was like colors that had never existed before. That it doesn't make sense. So I also would rather open on a single person observing the sky or doing something other than just standing there observing the sky, but give us the perspective of one person as opposed to just casting out this wide uh, descriptive net that your readers can't connect to because there's no one to connect to in this sentence. Cool. Uh, T.R. Gabriel, thank you for sending that one in. Science fiction through the slip. Uh, Okay. I'm going to bring up our next one. We're going through this at a nice, decent pace, uh, but we've got plenty to get through here. We'll go up straight to the uh, straight to the uh, end of the hour. Here is one from um, the category I've assigned on the uh, submission form called Other. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> at the edge of what she would have called a small town, a pious woman stood rage crying in an unholy church. Is the she of the first phrase the same woman rage crying? And why would she have called it a small town? Is it a small town? Or is it me being like, oh, Boston is so adorable because I am more of a New Yorker than a Bostonian, right? So like, how do we take that? Lots of questions. I am 0% interested in who calls what a small town. I also just want to say that for all that it's ambiguous and I'm asking questions about it, I don't actually care. So I would get rid of that first phrase. I would keep this pious woman rage crying in an unholy church, whatever that means. And, but I would make, you got to find some other way to begin. You need a beginning that's as strong as the ending. A pious woman stood rage crying in an unholy church. It's very strong. And maybe that's your whole first sentence. But if you, if you want to do a little more setting both of tone and physical setting and space and time uh you're gonna have to come up with something stronger than at the edge of what she would have called a small town but i like the second half cool thank you for sending that one in henry corrigan policy of a lifetime now i'm intrigued to see how that all connects up uh this next one is from craig r milton fippin Abercrombie is a collector of adventures and he keeps his collection in sealed jars in his pantry. I mean, it's a weird name, which like, okay, fine, but it's an inefficient sentence, which is not fine. Fippin Abercrombie keeps his collection of adventures in sealed jars in his pantry. Just as weird. 
just as interesting, more efficient. Because I guess fix it? no. Oh, sorry. You want me to? You don't have to, but like sometimes I think people like that. Uh, I don't so know. So which come again? Fip and Abercrombie keeps yep. his collection of adventures in sealed jars in his pantry. Or we could maybe we can make it even better. Let's see. Fip and Abercrombie hmm, keeps his collected adventures. Fip and sealed. Abercrombie's collection of adventures is kept. Mm. No. Fip and Abercrombie keeps his collection or keeps his collected adventures in sealed jars in his pantry. Adventures in sealed jars in his pantry. Let's see. Pippin Abraham keeps his collected adventures in sealed jars in his pantry. I like that. It's just as weird and quirky, but it's far more straightforward. Yeah. Like you have to balance your quirky weirdness with a, with a degree of straightforwardness. That's why I'm such a straight shooter. <laughs> to balance my whole personality. So <laughs> I think that works. I actually really like this. <laughs> I really like this now that we fixed it. <laughs> nice. <Use this. laughs> Craig, uh, that's from uh, Craig's children's book, The Adventures of Fippin Abercrombie. Good. Craig, you can use this one, this version. It's my gift to you. <laughs> uh, cool. Hey, we can get a few more in before the end of the hour. Uh, this yep. one is from Joe Taylor. Tell the people, if you have questions, put them in the comments now because Martin will pull a couple of questions toward the end. Cool. Uh, the car door slammed like a 21 gun salute and all the people coming up the street and the walk and the steps meant mama was in the ground. What? Oh, okay, so the car doors slammed. So it's many car doors slamming and then many people coming up the street and the, and the walk and the steps. I assume this is like a post-funeral wake or party mm. as the case may be. Uh, you got to get rid of this and all the people coming up the street and the walk and the steps. Yeah, the car doors slammed like a 21 gun salute. And so we knew, uh, so we knew mama was in the ground or which meant mama was in the ground. Something like that. Just make just shrink all that get all that rake all that out of there and uh keep the 21 gun salute keep mama in the ground find a way to make it work without all the extra stuff yeah okay that was uh oh i've lost that one there it's uh that was from uh margaret of thibodeau joe taylor a uh, young adult book uh cool uh, all right, we can do another one, and then let's do a few questions, perhaps. Uh, here we go. This one comes in from Rebecca Rivera. I mean, great name. She's turning into a lesbian. Martha rattled the pages under Herbert's nose. Huh. Okay, I want to point out that technically this is two sentences, because that's not a dialogue tag. The dialogue is a complete sentence, and the tag is a complete sentence. Um, but that's okay. I wonder if Martha is rattling the pages of someone's diary or something. I'm, I'm, I, I think I would probably, it's hard because it's such an interesting little snippet of dialogue. I would maybe articulate what these pages are. So Martha rattled the pages of her daughter's diary under Herbert's nose and then hit us with the dialogue maybe. I would have to look at it both ways, but I would get more specific about what these pages are from. And then uh, even if you keep the dialogue forward, I would still specify where the pages come from. But I like this. What's the title? We've been on a uh, roll. This one's called Really Me, a Young Adult uh, book. No, oh, I don't like that title at all. <laughs> that oh, was so close. Great name, uh, Rebecca Rivera. Yeah, great. You, you've, you've crushed the author name. I like the elements of your first line. I don't like your title. Cool. Uh, well, uh, as well, as you suggested, uh, we're going to, um, yeah, throw in uh, some questions. And this sort of leads in from that. Gordon asks, uh, Gordon's curious about your, uh, uh, well, it's not throw away, you mention it just about every time you do this, that you don't recommend starting with dialogue. Why, why is that the case? Gordon, I can tell you that dialogue is inherently without context. 
And the opening of a book has to establish lots of context. I, I also often say that the first line of a novel has to do a lot of heavy lifting and dialogue just does not allow for enough of that heavy, list, heavy lifting to take place because the dialogue in and of itself doesn't give us setting. It doesn't give us character necessarily. It doesn't, it doesn't give us conflict, right? It's almost asking too much of language to force all of those things into a snippet of dialogue. And that is why I recommend, I frequently recommend not starting with dialogue. Um, oh, CC Lee asks, uh, if wind is change, what are the other, other elements again? Uh, well, this is just sort of, if you learn how to, if, if you've ever studied poetry or literature, you'll know that wind often equates to change. Fire is often purification. Water is often birth or rebirth. Um, I don't know. Like that's, those are just kind of symbolic archetypes mm. in nature. But you, if you want to learn more about that, I would look up nature archetypes and enjoy falling down that delicious <laughs> rabbit hole because it is a long one. It is so long, but wind is the big one. The winds have changed. They, they're blowing on through. Uh, MK Vessel has the question, what are the elements that make a great first line? Uh, I love to see language play or um, language sophistication. So just like a really sharp, specific use of nouns and verbs. Um, a first line, a great first line starts either a ticking clock or suggests a mystery, right? It begins something that is quite enticing. Let's, let's put it to the test. I am looking at notes on your sudden disappearance. I am opening it pretty much for the first time. I read a couple of sentences in the bookstore. The first line is, you disappeared on a school night. Beautiful. So it's direct address, which is very cool and kind of unique. Um, it mentions a school night, which uh, provides a, a certain amount of characterization for the narrator because um, ch only children or teachers think of school night, right? Typically. Um, and we have a mystery. Someone has disappeared. So like it checks, check, check, all good. Let's try Northwoods. I've never opened this one. Bought it because of the pretty cover and the good reviews. Oh, it has, it's lovely already. It has beautiful, um, it has beautiful um, typeface. Okay. They had come to the spot in the freshness of June, chased from the village by its people, following deer path through the forest, the valleys, the fern groves, and the quaking bogs. Woo! Uh, I love it, right? So it, this this is a great sentence because it, um, it mimics the action, right? These people are going into the woods and the sentence itself is many small phrases connected by commas. It travels into itself. It invites us into the novel the way that we would travel into the woods through a long um, sort of directed path. It's very, uh, it's focused on nature and yet it juxtaposes nature against the people in the village who have chased away the they of word one. So like, instantly effective, right? Super effective first line. So I think a first line is strongest when it does a lot of work. And both of those lines, one of which is extremely long and one of which is quite short, they both do a lot of work. Yeah, we've got a question here that's, uh, well, maybe not directly related, but I'm interested in knowing. Uh, what are your thoughts on how AI will affect editing in the future? That's a great question. Um, I, I think about this a lot and then I try not to think about it ever. For me, AI might be able to do some really good things in terms of making uh, edit, uh, certain types of editing more accessible to more people by reducing its cost. In many ways, grammar can be formulaic and even mathematical in its application, and AI might be very capable of bringing prose into like a sense of uniform grammatical use, which can be very helpful. Do I think AI makes a good developmental editor? No, I hope not. <laughs> when I edit a manuscript, I'm bringing to bear upon it not only my education, but my lifetime of reading. I'm also bringing my identity and my bias and my prejudice. And yes, sometimes that is limiting, but sometimes it's critical. And so I don't think that AI will be able to amalgamate um, that kind of, of developmental work 
because it is so dependent on on how your editor has processed everything they've ever read and then and then brings that reading experience to bear on your manuscript. And I am not sure that that can be simulated. Well, we'll revisit this conversation in three years time when we're both applying for jobs in HVAC repair. Um, cool. Uh, just, I think I can see one more question. Uh, and so then we, we, I think we both need more sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. What is it? Mm. Oh, just wait. Is everyone's, I don't know, I thought someone was saying that, uh, yeah, everyone's saying, yeah, experience counts, AI can't invent your voice, it's all positive stuff. It's good to remind us that. Ooh, not out of a job yet, A plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're fine for now, but uh, I'm still, I'm still going to have to pick up some practical skills. I'll learn woodworking. Um, <laughs> I can, we can both crochet. Let's open up a, a yarn works. Oh, yeah. We both, uh, before we were incidentally both crocheting. <laughs> I can... Oh, thank you, thank you, Stefania. Is that Stefania? I need my readers yeah. on. Your name is very tiny. Oh, that helps. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I well, hope so. I think, uh, yeah, and that probably brings us to the end. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. This is uh, super fun, as always. I really look forward to these. Uh, we'll, we'll have to have one uh, of these before long. Everyone watching at home, please do give this a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We've got brand new stuff every single week. Uh, and live streams every week or every other week. Uh, next week, if you like the idea of getting feedback, we're actually doing a live editing session with Tom Bromley, who's our head of learning. He's an editor and ghostwriter. Uh, and so if you want to, go to blog.readz.com slash live, sign up for that, and you can submit up to 500 words, ideally also maybe from your first chapter. Uh, and we're going to pick like three or four of them, and he'll uh, use his magic tablet and uh, you can watch while he marks up uh, a whole chapter in front of your very That's eyes. Good. That's going to be amazing. Yeah, we've done one before. Actually, like, really, really quite good. Uh, I think it's something that we should probably be doing more because it sort of shows the kind of work that our editors do. Uh, but right now, we're using it as a promotional tool for our, our learning course, um, our sort of novel writing course. Um, Fair enough. Uh, but cool. Uh, Becca, any sort of uh, last thoughts, any recommendations, any sort of uh, words of wisdom or encouragement before we sign off? Um, the best writers are good readers. Be sure to read a lot and be supportive of authors. Never tag them in negative reviews, but always tag them in positive ones. Um, write, write, write. <laughs> then edit, edit, edit. <laughs> then edit some more. And uh, just, you know, do, do your good work. Go out and do your good work. And That's remember, fine. AI editors can never replace humans. Thank you. <laughs> that has been my TED Talk. Uh, see you soon, Becca. Bye.